Question 16. I share an extension with a co-worker and I cannot access my voicemail. The prompt says I am entering the wrong security code. Answer. After pressing your message key or dialing extension 3 to 7900 from your office phone, you will receive a prompt to enter the mailbox number. You must enter your individual 7-digit mailbox number and then press hash. This number usually starts with 100xxxx or 101xxxx. Then, enter your password followed by hash. Question 17. I recorded an out-of-office greeting and now I can't remove it. What do I do? Answer. Access your voice mailbox. If you recorded a temporary greeting, the system will tell you that a temporary greeting is being used. Press 8, 2, 3 and when prompted, press 7, 6 to delete it. Question 18. I do not recognize a company listed on my bill. Who are they? And why are they billing me? Answer. Your bill must include the name and toll-free telephone number of any company that has charged you for its services, along with the charges for those services. If you don't recognize the company or have questions about the services for which you've been billed, call the company to ask for more information about the services. Some service providers do not bill their customers directly, so they must contract with local companies to bill for for them. These service providers send us your usage data electronically and we use that information to bill on their behalf. Increasingly, telemarketers and scam artists use customers' phone numbers to post unauthorized and fraudulent charges in the data sent to us for billing. These charges can be for many things but the result is that the charges are included in the billing data. We have no way to monitor its accuracy. The billing rules are intended to make sure that the format of your bill helps you more easily identify any unauthorized or fraudulent charges. Question 19. Why are the charges from each company listed separately on my bill? Answer. The TIB rules require that we organize your bill so that charges from each company billing you for service appear separately. For example, if you have chosen one long-distance company for your in-region intralata long-distance calls and another for your out-of-region and state-to-state -state interlata calls, your bill will list the calls with each company separately. Question 20. A company has listed charges on my bill for telephone-related services that I do not understand and the description is unclear. How can I get them explained? Answer. You may find charges on your bill that are not from your local company. The name and toll-free number of the company charging you for telephone-related services is listed in the section where those charges appear. You should call that company and ask for an explanation. You can also dispute the charges and request that the company remove them from your bill, as your local Local company. We remind you that as part of our service commitment, our business office is always available if you have questions about your bill. If you have any difficulty in contacting the service providers listed on your bill, or if you're not satisfied with the response they give you, we help you resolve the problem. Question 21. There is a statement on my bill that says, this company did not bill you for services in the previous billing cycle. What does that mean? Answer. In its rules, the FCC ordered that customers be notified of a new service provider any time a bill includes charges from a company that did not bill the customer for services in the previous billing cycle. However, such notification applies only to subscribed services, i.e., when a service provider has a continuing relationship with a customer and likely plays places regular or periodic charges on your bill. For example, long-distance surcharges, voicemail, internet access, and other services that continue until you terminate them are subject to the notification rule. On the other hand, services billed on a per transaction basis such as directory assistance, dialer round 10 to 10, toll calls, and other non-recurring paper call services are not subject to the notification requirements. Question 22. If I want to dispute a charge that appears on my bill and don't pay the charge while I'm disputing it, how will I know if my local service will be disrupted? Answer. We identify all charges on your bill that, if not paid, could result in the disconnection of your basic local service. Such services are listed as deniable charges. Our state PUC designates the individual charges we must classify as deniable and those charges are identified on your bill. Non-payment of other non-deniable charges can result in the termination of that specific service but will not lead to the disconnection of basic local service. If you don't recognize the charges, you should call the toll-free number listed on the bill within 60 days to ensure there is no interruption of the service in question.
Question 23. I am confused about some of the toll-free numbers listed on my bill. Is the actual service provider always the appropriate party for me to contact? Answer. Some service providers bill you directly. Others use third parties known as billing agents or aggregators to bill for them. Thus, the actual service provider is not always the appropriate party to contact if you have questions or problems. In fact, some service providers have contracted with third party billing agents or aggregators just to handle inquiry and dispute resolution of the charges placed on your bill. The rules require that the toll free number listed on your bill as the inquiry contact, regardless of whether whether it's for the actual provider, a billing agent or an aggregator must connect you to someone who has sufficient knowledge and authority to resolve account inquiries and requests for adjustment. The FCC allows the use of inquiry contacts because of consumer concerns about the complexity of their bills and because of increased fraud and abuse. Question 24. Are service providers required to list their business address? How can I contact a provider if I'm not satisfied with the resolution reached on the phone? Answer. Service providers are not required to include their business address on each telephone bill for the receipt of consumer inquiries and complaints. However, they are required to make their business address available to consumers on request through their toll-free number. Question 25. What is the basic local service rate and how is it billed? Answer. In most cases, the basic local service rate covers your dial tone. The service connection that allows you to make and receive local non-toll calls. Failure to pay the basic local service rate and applicable taxes and fees will result in disconnection and loss of service. Local telephone service is billed one month in advance and is usually due within 10 days after receipt. Charges for usage, on the other hand, are billed after a particular service, for example, long distance calls, calling card, wireless, etc. is used. Question 26. Why did the FCC authorize increases in the federal SLC? Answer. As part of its effort to promote competition, the FCC reviewed the rules and regulations that govern the telephone industry and decided to rebalance rates and charges. The SLC increases reflect the FCC's belief that end-user customers should be more directly responsible for the costs necessary to provide them service and that the access charges paid by long-distance companies should be reduced. In 2000, the FCC authorized the first in a series of SLC increases for the large local companies, reasoning that rural customers should pay the same levels of subscriber line charges as urban customers. The FCC expanded the SLC changes to community-based telecom providers in 2001. Question 27. What is the Federal Universal Service Charge? FUSC. Answer. The Federal Universal Service Charge. FUSC. Also authorized by the FCC. Is not part of your local service rate. The charge helps to keep rates affordable for all Americans, regardless of where they live. The amount of the FUSC on your monthly bill depends on the services you order and the number of telephone lines you have. Generally, the surcharge is applied per line. In July 2002, the FCC authorized an increase in the FUSC to $0.46 per month per line, and in July 2003, FUSC charge became 9.1% of the SLC charge. The federal government has established national programs to support universal telephone service. The Federal Universal Service Fund assists with the costs of providing affordable telecommunications service to low-income individuals and to residents in rural, high-cost areas. In addition, Congress has expanded the program to help schools, libraries, and rural health care providers obtain leading-edge services, such as high-speed Internet access. All providers of telecom services contribute to the support of these universal service programs. Question 28. Where do the federal SLC and FUSC fees go? Answer. The federal SLC and FUSC fees go to federal administrative agencies created to oversee and manage the funds. The federal SLC fees are redistributed to local telephone companies based on our specific costs. These funds enable us and other local companies and cooperatives in hard-to-serve, high-cost areas to recover some of the costs of the facilities we use to connect your home or business. The FUSC FUSC fees allow us to recover our contribution assessments for the Federal Universal Service programs. A portion of the funds collected from the Federal Universal Service charge is distributed to keep rates in high-cost rural areas at or near the national average. 
Question 29. What does universal service mean to me? Answer. For almost 70 years, the nation has made a policy commitment to make telephone service available to as many Americans as possible, rich or poor, rural or urban. When Congress passed the Communications Act in 1934, it established the concept of universal service as a principle to promote the development and reach of the national telephone network by distributing costs across various services and users in order to connect all segments of the American American public. Universal service recognizes the economic reality that the cost of providing telephone service in rural areas such as where public service telephone operates is significantly higher than in well-populated urban parts of the country, but that the nation as a whole benefits from a network that connects to as many Americans as possible. We can look on universal service as a system by which everyone benefits because everyone else has a telephone. Because of universal service, independent companies serving high-cost rural areas have been assured of appropriate recognition of their costs, and Americans have been assured of quality telephone service at reasonable rates, no matter where they live. Question 30. How does the universal service support system work? Answer. Traditionally, long-distance carriers paid access charges to local companies for access to the local network to enable customers to make or receive long-distance calls. These access charge dollars reflect a legitimate business cost. Compensating local companies for the long-distance carriers use of our networks. Universal service support and access charge revenues are essential to community-based telecom providers. These programs have help companies serving rural areas keep local rates affordable and comparable to rates in urban areas where the population is more densely clustered and costs are not as high. We continue to rely on this support today. Given the costs of the equipment and facilities necessary to make new and advanced services available to rural customers, 